and welcome back to THU TV here in sunny Troia in Portugal. Uh, I'm here with my amazing friend Stuart, and we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, what has changed in our various industries and where the opportunities are now for people who are just entering the industry. So Stuart, if you wouldn't mind awfully, um, can you tell us a little bit about what your career trajectory has been and um, what you've been up to? Well, trajectory implies that I'm returning back to Earth. I like to think <laughs> the that I'm, I'm still on an ascendancy. I'm trying to <coughs> leave orbit. Um, I uh, studied computer science and electrical engineering at Cal Berkeley and uh, had a job out of college at IBM, which was sort of the Google Facebook of its time. And in the early 80s, I was lucky enough to meet the founders of Electronic Arts uh, they had just raised a bunch of money, and they, they started a company with two big ideas. One was that great interactive entertainment, which is, we didn't call them games, great interactive entertainment are like books and music that cr great creative people don't want to be employees of large companies. And the idea was to build a company around that idea. So the, the original name of the company was Soft Arts, uh, which thankfully we moved from there to <laughs> Electronic <just> Arts. <laughs> I'm sure there's a Soft art somewhere that makes uh, uh, a, a very different form of entertainment. <laughs> uh, so Electronic Arts was started with the idea of this software artist. And so, so in that sense, it was about making the independent artists successful and building a company around them that could handle the financing and the marketing and the distribution. Uh, and uh, so I started producing products for them, which meant I went out and acquired, and I, I, I turned over rocks, met talented young people, and I mean young. My first product was from a 15-year-old. My next product was from a 17-year-old. My next couple products were 19, and, and these were one one-person products, a music product, a couple flying products, paint products, and eventually the teams became bigger, and eventually because my products were successful, I stopped producing and I started managing people who were producing, and then eventually managing people who were managing people who were producing. And uh, then I left. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> so we, we went to, uh, we went, I, I left and there were about 1,200 employees. Uh, so much for a small company, huh? What? So much for a small company. Yeah, so much for a small <laughs> company. And I, it, it, you know, we, we uh, Trip Hawkins was the founder and, uh, uh, you know, I could go on for, on all the things that I learned from him. But, but the one um, that seems most relevant is that, um, uh, we were all we were trying to figure out how to keep the entrepreneurial spirit, how to how to avoid being a big company, and 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 we did. We were quite successful at that. For me personally, being a senior vice president and then a general manager meant I wasn't in the room with all the fun people anymore. I was in. With, so it, I, I eventually left. First, we we were to spin a company out of uh, EA, and it was going to focus on on uh, Hollywood meets Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. So I was out trying to find, my, 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 my basic thesis was um, great intellectual properties are created by people who are talented in their particular medium. So I looked for visual artists, writers, uh, animators, and, and of course engineering. And so I went to Hollywood and, and looked for people who could create those properties. Our, our, our success, EA's success, really was, at the time, what most people know us for the sports products. John Madden football, NBA basketball, Dr. J and Larry Bird, uh, you know, Tiger Woods golf. And what I kept saying was, uh, we're paying money, licensing money to those people. At the end of the day, we have no IP. And we need to learn how to create IP uh, uh, because then we can exploit it outside of our medium. You know, my yeah. my um, my model was Disney, uh, the good parts of Disney, and and uh, so so that's what. Uh, so originally I was leaving to do that. That ended up not being the right 
relationship with the EA, so I did it on my own. And then ever since then, I've been mostly trying to follow the latest trends in interactivity. I went from social networking to online karaoke contests, to online photo contests, to virtual worlds, to, uh, and then finally the last project I did with Trip was a uh, kid's uh, educational product that taught them emotional intelligence. Awesome. Uh, so I've done all kinds of things, but it always on the product end, and and the uh, the interest for me has always been uh, combining talent, finding finding recognizing first, and finding finding people and putting them together in the room and see what the hell happens. And uh, you know, fortunately, lots of times it worked, plenty of times it didn't, but. Uh, um, you know, hanging around talented people is sort of my thing. Awesome. So it actually sounds like you've solved or have been successful in solving one of the hardest problems about building companies and stuff, which is finding out who is actually good. What? What? How do you talk to somebody and you know that they're an amazing um, person and a talented so producer? I, they, <clears throat> the, the presentation I gave um, today, in fact... I said there are four things you need to be successful. Number one is the ability to recognize talent. And uh, so we spent quite a bit of time talking about it. Uh, the, the, the thing that I will tell you that I've learned the hard way uh, is talented people and not so talented people say mostly the same words. Uh, the not so talented ones learn the words from the talented people. So. Uh, Talk is bullshit, basically. And it's really about what have they actually done. And then more importantly, the minute you get to the point of understanding that they may have done something that's interesting to you, uh, is to try and understand their point of view. And so over the years, I've learned a lot of thing, ways to determine what somebody's real point of view is. Because at the end of the day, what I'm interested in is really two things. One is somebody's who has good taste, which means they understand what the popular, what will be popular and what will be successful. And then do they have the ability to communicate it so that they can lead a team or guide a group or influence the marketing folks? Uh, and you ne you really need both of those. Uh, I, and and then of course the the underlying assumption is they're smart as shit. <laughs> you know, you, <laughs> sure. it, uh, 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 it, this is, it's a super, you know, super demanding um, uh, type of work. It's, um, uh, you know, being around a lot of animators and artists here, uh, th there are no, very few engineers actually at this conference and it, it uh, uh, w without them, uh, you can't really do games obviously, or, or, or mostly you can't. And uh, the, uh, uh, the, the thing about it is they can make or break you. You know, you can do great art. I mean, it, there's the art. <laughs> but if you got shitty engineering and you play the thing and it's sluggish or it doesn't look right or right. it's not engaging or, or whatever, that's an engineering problem. So it, it really is. Uh, it's also... Um, uh, it, uh, you know, betting on talent requires a certain amount of uh, the ability to not worry, because uh, it's a worrying business. I mean, yeah. I, mean I uh, you know, I worried, I worried about everything, uh, and and the more talented w they were, the more you worried because then you needed them. Uh, I think the engineering and games design piece of it is really interesting there because I mean, if you know, in the early 80s when I started gaming um, on the old Commodore 64 type uh, games, if you look at, back at them now, they look horrendous, but they were super entertaining and they were easy enough to make that somebody like me could go, you know what, I think I, think I could make a game. I think, obviously, you can't build a FIFA <laughs> on your own, but you can actually build something that is entertaining and fun. And I think I having the layer of art on that that is really inspirational and good is super important, but I think if you had to choose one or the other, 
it would have to be the playability and the entertainment. No, absolutely, of it. absolutely. I, I, the, the, you know, we're not making picture books, right? Right. <laughs> so, I, uh, the, the, what I will say though that is quite heartening, um, and not to put too fine a point on it, but you know, as I said, you know, 30 plus years ago, it was you know one or two man teams. It's still possible to do that today because of things like um, uh, uh, Unity. Uh, and the Unreal Engine and all these these platforms where clearly there is some engineering involved, but it's m much more parametrically driven and there, there's not, a, strictly speaking, as much coding involved. And so, the other big change that has happened is the distribution channels, right? The app and, stores and the make that. Yeah, and the distribution part. It, it used to, you know, I'm, uh, you know, when I first started getting in mobile, it was this incredible sigh of relief because, uh, uh, you know, the first thing we would do is we had to build products that had to go and re they got put in boxes, so they had to get manufactured, so we had to guess at how many we needed, and then they had to get put in a truck and sent off to God only knows where, and they'd eventually show up at Tame Kmart or Walmart or Toys R Us if the buyer, who some guy, you, you know, you hardly knew, liked your product. And if, if you know, you put 20,000 of them out into the channel or half a million of them into the channel, and if they didn't sell, they sent them back. Yeah. You know, whereas today, it's, you know, you test market in Canada and Australia, and you look at what kind of download rates you're getting, and you figure out where you can spend the money. It's a much more controllable problem. Um, you know, the bad news is, is the, you know, Apple takes 30% before you've even, you know, uh, sold your first copy. So, uh, but the good news is they offer a very orderly marketplace, um, and there are a lot fewer moving parts. It's a lot more control of it. It's a lot more easier to be independent uh, today uh, than it was, you know, uh, in years past. Yeah. I mean, I, I've done some hardware problems. Uh, problems. I call them problems. There yeah. were products. That, I've done some yeah. hardware problems. We say the opportunities. There <laughs> opportunities, are no problems. Sure. There are only opportunities. Um, and I would have given my right arm to only have to pay 30% for our distribution costs. Yeah. Uh, and in one way, it's a shame that Apple takes so much money. On the other hand, great. Take care of the entire end-to-end -end distribution channel for me. You can have your 30%. So, so that that's part it. of it is beautiful. I, the, 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 uh, yeah. I, so when, when we would sell a product for forty dollars retail, typically we netted twenty. Uh, the the retail outlet would would and they would take all the markup uh, on that. Uh, the the um, uh, yeah, it, it's believe me, it's a lot less headache. It's a different. I mean, you're compete. Uh, I'm sure this is, number's wrong or changed or different, but it used to be 10,000 apps are submitted every day in, in the app store. Well, geez, yeah, you know, a How shelf. How do you stand in, out, right? <laughs> a shelf in uh, uh, you know um, uh, 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 a retail store is only this big. Yeah, you know, it's that's not 10,000. Compete with, and yeah. that's all you need. It's not 10,000. So I. I at least in that sense, you have, have a chance to get into the marketplace. It's discovery and the ability to create a product that has word of mouth and virality associated with it, and and you want to tell your friends and bring them into it. It's a it's much different design challenge. I really like the bit you were mentioning about IP earlier as well, and owning your own IP. I mean, ultimately, I spoke to a couple of years ago. I spoke to Pet, uh, Peter Westerbacher of Rovio. Um, and obviously, they have really leveraged that. I mean, they had 30 games that kind of did meh. They, they you said 30, right? 30. Yeah, that's important 30 or to 60, remember. I, many. I, so I, I, I don't know about theirs. I know that uh, Supercell, it was, uh, it was almost 100 right. but before they hit the ball out of the park. Yeah. And with them, they had a huge number of games. Most of them all Flash games. Yeah, and, yeah. and they were like, oh, this cool mobile thing. Let's try it out. And Angry Birds happened. And of course, that went off the charge. Still. And it's still going crazy, and they're, they're printing money, which is great for them. But the amazing thing that's happened, I think, is that that IP of those stupid little birds has actually become incredibly valuable. There's movies, there's cups, there's t-shirts, there's God knows what. 
and they are making as much money on that as to do on the games. Yeah, so <clears throat> absolutely, if you look at the economics of that, uh, if you have a property that has brand recognition, your return on investment is significantly higher. Uh, the, but the problem is exactly what they've all experienced. So you got to put you got to put a bunch of uh, pun, bunch of them into the game b before you pick before you pick one winner, and uh, uh, that unfortunately is expensive uh, expensive to do. Uh, the the uh, one of my favorite lines from a guy named Brandon Tartikoff. Mm -hmm. You know him from U.S. television. He, he invented uh, must-see TV on Thursday nights. Mm -hmm. uh, sadly, the anchor of that was the Bill Cosby show, which uh, has fallen in disfavor, but he, he was a programming genius. But he said all hits are flukes, and you have to plan for them to be flukes, and that's what a lot of these uh, uh, European mobile developers have figured out. And then when one hat hits, then you got to follow it up, and you got to yep. follow it up, and you got to follow it up. But to go into the marketplace, you know, when I did the kids' product a couple years ago, uh, with no branding on it other than fabulous content, four and a half stars, you know, quarter of a million downloads, featured multiple times on the App Store, even when they hit the paywall, to give us, you know, the equivalent of four or five euros, they went no. Huh? Because there's so much kids software that's free, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you know it's it's a tough world out there. It, it really is, and and it's always a surprise, um, or it should always be a surprise. Maybe you believe in what you, you know what you're doing, but uh, when it really works, it's really fun, and when it doesn't, it's you got to just it gets start. A tricky. <laughs> you got to try it again. So um, I think our audience is mostly artists. Uh -huh. um, and if they're watching this, presumably they are very interested in getting into gaming. Um, is there anything to artists learning how to actually do more engineering type stuff, or is there anything in particular you can do to, as an artist, make yourself more attractive to a games company? Well, I, I, the <clears throat> just going back to something I said earlier, um, uh, point of view I think is is really important in the sort of subhead under that is, do you know what everybody else is doing? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was always very frustrating to me to meet people who wanted to be in games and hadn't played everything. And no, I don't really have time for that, I'm busy working. Well, uh, that just means you don't know what everybody you're competing with is, is, is doing. Uh, the, the other thing is for artists, en engineers can't do art. We used to refer to games as having programmer art in them. Right. And, and in the early days, I, I, I first started adding artists to the team. I'd have, you know, the 15 year old, I'd say, we're going to get an artist for you. Uh, so these days, they can, use, uh, they can use Unity to create prototy interactive prototypes. Uh, they can use Unreal Engine to create interactive prototypes. And I think those. The, an, an artist is much better equipped today, artists and animators, well, animators for sure, uh, character designers, uh, are, are much better equipped to get their way into the, in, to prove that they can do things um, uh, in, in sort of a, a, a more holistic way. Engineers, uh, you know, they can say, well, I was the guy who did this on this project. They can put prototypes together, but a, a good engineer is going to need an artist. Although, actually, uh, sorry, uh, the the um, uh, the Unity store is crammed with assets. Mm -hmm. If I go in and I say I want to, you know, I, I'm a bunch of clowns, I'm I'm pretty sure I can do a search in the Unity store and get a bunch of clowns, and they're all rigged right and everything. So it's an engineer. I, so I I would say the the short answer, whether you're an engineer or an artist is, you know, know the marketplace and start working on it. And, and it's, uh, it's important to recognize that uh, people pay for interactivity, so what you're showing better be interactive. Right, so and just if, some pre-rendered animation isn't really what they're... Yeah. And if, it's, if you're into characters, then show us how the characters move. Uh, uh, you know, the more you can do on your own, I mean, you understand this is, 
um, it's like a lot of businesses, it's very risky. And as you're putting a team together, trying to figure out what can you do and what can't you do, you go, well, who's going to who's going to be a surprise and who's going to be an unpleasant surprise? Yeah. So you're all going to be surprises. Some of you yeah, are going to get right. fired. <laughs> no, they're yeah, they're nothing but surprises, and 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 it's really management of the surprises that is the challenge. And so you're constantly, as a producer, trying to look around and go. Who, who can I give more work to and who should I be watching more closely? And anything you can do to make them sleep better at night uh, improves your odds of getting a job. I see uh, a book coming out, Steward's Guide to Hiring, <laughs> Surprise yeah. Management. Yeah, I, I, I actually, that was sort of part of one of the present, part of my presentation is, is uh, how do you make sure you don't, uh, well, you know, Bad shit happens. I, I don't know what else to say, but but to, to make sure you don't, um, you know, spiral downward, but figure out how to recover. Yeah, it's not just Plan B. It's Plan C, D, E, and F too. The interesting thing you just mentioned just now about um, about risk, right? So it feels like a lot of people feel that, uh, especially if you're young to the industry, you haven't really seen the inside of it. These game companies, they just seem to be loaded. They have lots of money, nothing could possibly go wrong. But what I think a lot of people don't realize is that once you're on a project, that project itself is still under a huge amount of risk and you know, there's a huge amount of stuff that goes wrong or that, that, that are challenges. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, what it's actually like when you land your first job and you open the doors to the studio and you walk inside and suddenly it isn't just a... Uh, a winter wonderland of, of, of amazing. Well, I, you know, there are a bunch of, uh, uh, again, there are a bunch of things that before you decide to take that particular job, questions you need to ask uh, of, of the people that are hiring you, including, um, uh, you know, what happens if something goes wrong? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you find a company that is creatively driven, uh, w which is much better in my experience than driven by the money people and the marketing people. Yeah. But do they at least have somebody that's watching the money? And, uh, you know, wh what happens if this takes longer? Or what happens if this doesn't sell as well? Or, or, or what happens if, you know, our money runs out? Uh, you know, these are important questions to ask, and, and most people are so excited to have the opportunity they don't ask them uh, but if it's a if it's a good organization they'll help you uh, uh, understand all that stuff because they don't want you going home at night worrying about that this is hard enough to build I don't need to worry about the work I need to do and whether the company's going to fall apart yeah Right, so so the company, you know, we spent. I, I I mean, really conservatively, I'd say we spent 25 percent of the executives' team time, sort of, you know, reinforcing the vision, making sure everybody felt comfortable with what we were doing, uh, because we don't want them to be distracted. There, we had a um, a way of talking about it. We managed anxiety upward and confidence downward. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm not bullshit confidence, like uh, I'm not, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, everything's fine. Yeah. I mean, you know, honesty and integrity are an important part of it, too. So, yeah. I, you know, I think the short answer is before anybody takes a job, they ought to ask lots of questions and not be afraid to even ask difficult questions. I think some of the best hires I've ever had for my startups have been people who came in and asked the, the really hard questions, right? They ask, okay, what is your goal? Where are we going? How much money do you have in the bank? You know, how much runway do we have? You know, how how confident are you? Yeah. And occasionally, yeah. as a hiring person, you're sitting there going, Yeah. Oh, yep. I don't know how I'm going to make pay run this month. Yeah. But. Yeah. No, I I I I, I, I we used to um, we had a guy on the board when we first started the company, Fred Davis, and and he was replaced by another guy named Bob Cohn, and I'd come into the board meetings, and I'd go, Yeah, 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 yeah and the pitching and and they'd always go ask the one question. And I go, oh, shit, that's a really good question. Yeah, I'm a big fan of questions. I, you know, the the um, uh, the only questions that I don't like are the ones that don't get asked. Yep. Uh, and and I I think that you know if you're a, you're about to commit you know your next period of time to somebody, you have the right to ask them any question you want. And I think if they if they're uncomfortable with that, that tells you something right there because they're. Uh, 
Uh, you know, one of the things I said the other day is, is if, it, if an offer is too good to be true, it probably is. Mm -hmm. And that goes to your point of view thing, right? If you, yeah. don't, if you don't have the ability to look at the vision for the whole company, yeah. even though you're only a little cog, you're not a little cog, you're a really important piece of a... Of well, a my, last, uh, my last job when I w took over as head of product for this company, I, um, I walked in and I interviewed everybody. I said, what do you think you're building? And why do you think you're building it? Who do you think it's for? And it was about a 100-person company, and I got, you know, about 50 different answers. And I went, clearly there's an opportunity to improve the vision for the company, mm -hmm. to solidify the plan, get everybody signed up and on board for it, and, and communicate it and reinforce it. And, and, you know, at every one of the all hands, I'd say, here's how we're doing on that plan. Yeah, you because get everybody pulling in exactly the same direction. Because people want to go home at the end of the night, and when their wife or girlfriend or partner says, "How'd your day go?" and what do you? It's like I, I don't know. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's that's it's like uh, they, they they want to be able to tell a great story and and feel good about what they're doing, and that's part of you know that's that's what the leadership is. Uh, um, that's their job. Awesome. Yeah. Well, on that note, we have blasted past our twenty-five minutes. It's over like that. Um, Stuart, thank you so much for coming and oh, talking to bet. me for a bit. And, uh, Good questions, thank THU you. To crowd, uh, we're back after a short break. See you guys soon.